I moved from the inner city of where I grew up to then I started to minister and I felt a call to go into the inner city. And I understood the streets better than I understood anything else. And, I, and that's where I got my call to ministry. And I started with the YMCA and with Young Life and with a Mennonite church. And we all worked together collectively. And I was on the city streets. And that's where I really felt that call. And what I recognized one day was that I was most effective for the gospel when I had a ball in one hand and a Bible in the other. If I just had the Bible, I wasn't effective. If I just had the ball, I wasn't effective, but it was with both. And that grew and we had hundreds and hundreds of kids every week coming through our facilities. And we were working with them in a lot of different ways, but always proclaiming Christ. And what's a great joy today is that many of those kids that I had those conversations with, son, I'm gonna come visit you in one of three places. And Many of them made a decision for Christ and landed in the church. Hi, welcome back to the Ministry of Misfits podcast. This is episode number four. Um, and again, today I am joined by Dr. Greg Linville, and we're going to continue kind of walking through what this podcast is about. Um, we're kind of doing this out of order since we actually started with an interview with Bradley Barnes, but it was an important topic that we wanted to make sure um, people were able to, to get and grab a hold of. Um, and so now we're going to kind of walk through what we're doing and why. Um, last week, Dr. Linville talked with us about the three-tier paradigm of theological truths, um, philosophical principles, and methodological models, and how we kind of use that both within Overwhelming Victory and CSRM, but also as well in ministry and just in personal Christian life. And we talked a little bit about how to get involved with theology. Um, today, though, Dr. Linville is here. We're going to actually talk about evaluating ministry using the fourfold rubric. So Dr. Linville, welcome back. Thank you. It's great to be here. So the fourfold rubric is the next chapter in the book that we teased a little bit last week and that the CSRM podcast has been walking through for the past month or so. Um, this is the way that we are able to look at those methodological models specifically that we talked about last week and actually be able to evaluate whether one, they're worth doing and two, whether or not they actually have been successful. So Talk us, talk us through a little bit. Give us what what is this fourfold rubric? Yeah, the fourfold rubric comes to us because when we started to talk to sports ministers and to trustees and deacons and elders and lead pastors, we got four answers to what is success, and it some of it were precursors actually what we got to success. And so the four words are strategic. Some people said it's successful when it's strategic. And then others said it's, it's successful when it's relevant. And then others said it's efficient. Now you can imagine those are the finance committee kind of <laughs> folks. Um, and they're very important uh, and helpful to us. And then effect effective is really kind of where all the other ones land at some point when we walked it all through. But it's what we talk about in some of these books that we've talked about, soteriology, the, the saving of church, or saving of sports ministry, rather, that what's your success statistics? First of all, identifying what is success, and then what do your statistics tell you about that? So bridging from last week to this week, the relevancy of, of the three-tier paradigm leading into the fourfold evaluative rubric is helpful to, for us to understand, are we really being successful? And if, if that success statistic says that it's somebody who has was far from Jesus, far from the church, but they came to a personal faith in Christ, and they now we start to add some things. Did they get baptized? Did they join a Bible study? Did they join a particular congregation? 
what, what are these success statistics? And some of our efficiency gurus are saying, well, last year, we spent $100,000 on local outreach and missionary work. And we had one person join the church. So are we really saying that it takes $100,000 a year to just get one person? We can't afford to, to, to reach 100 people. We just can't afford it. So maybe our relevancy is not very good or efficiency isn't very good. Now, how does all, what does this all translate into? If you're a sports minister and you're watching or listening, it's relevant for you. It's strategic for you. And it's going to be efficient, effective for you because you're going to keep your job. You're going to keep your ministry position in the church. If you are actually taking that one person a year and making it 100 people a year, then suddenly that $100,000 looks pretty good. And $100,000, there's no magic to that. But we know that there are many of the sports rec and fitness ministries out there that are spending over a million dollars or $10 million dollars maintaining 17 ball fields and, and four courts on a gymnasium and paying for the staff. I mean, there's a lot. And if that is not paying a dividend of that, there's new people coming to Christ and being discipled, joining the church, then there's going to be a lot of people saying this just doesn't work. All right. So let's back up. What's strategic? Strategic is obviously something that helps you reach the people that you feel you're called to reach. You first have to do a demographic study and say, here's the group of people that we're positioned and called to reach. Geographically, it's between that bridge and that interstate or that mountain and that river. Geographically, it's in this community. It might be around a high school, a school system, it might be around the name of a city or a town or a county. And it's also demographic. What age group, what language group, what cultural group, who are we supposed to reach? So once you've identified who it is that you're positioned and called to reach, then what's strategic? Well, we know sport and rec fitness is, generally speaking, but let's make it more specific. If I want to be strategic, and then this starts to bleed into relevant, and I live in the state of Indiana in the United States, I better be able to understand basketball. If you are where I live in Canton, Ohio, you better understand American football. Now, if you're in Pakistan, you better know cricket. And if you're in New Zealand, you better know rugby. South Africa, you better know rugby and, and, and what we call soccer, they would call football. Brazil, you better know that football, that, that, that you, you, get, you get the sense. Now, it's not only strategic in that it's sport and it's reaching, but it's the relevant sport. It's the relevant thing. What's a big thing in America right now is fitness. Fitness, wholeness, wellness. If you're not really thinking strategically and relevantly about what can we do in terms of providing fitness and wholeness and wellness, what's a crying need in countries across the world are to reach those people who have physical, emotional, relational, cognitive barriers. And they're not disabled people, but they are people that have a certain disability. And every one of us is like that in some degree. But this is a relevant way now today. And we've got a book coming out soon, uh, authored by Dr. Vicki Byler and others, that is helping us. And it's called From Barriers to Belonging. How can local churches really strategically and relevantly reach that group of people? And there's also, um, while we're on that topic, there's also a, already um, a resource out. Um, if you go to the Tuesday Talk podcast or go to our Tuesday Talk catalog on Facebook or um, YouTube, we've already done a Tuesday Talk with Ryan Wolf, who's doing a lot of the leading in this this area. Um, 
and, and a couple others talking about barriers to belonging. How do you actually, you know, how does your ministry actually work for people coming with it, with disabilities? Um, you also, I'm not sure if it will be ready yet by the time this releases, but all of our overwhelming victory videos that we are going to be doing in the future, we're hoping because of this work that's strategically relevant and efficiently effective that Dr. Byler is doing, um, the videos may start looking a little bit different because we've heard from our hearing impaired audience as well as our dyslexic audience and even me as the colorblind guy who's somehow you put in charge of doing all of your designing, which not not sure the efficient effectiveness of that decision there, Dr. Linville, but um, you know, we we have there are certain things that, you know, we need to adjust and so we're going to adjust them. So don't be surprised when you start seeing that as well. Yeah, and we've had for a long time with some of our YouTube, et cetera, that, that they already do some of the closed caption for us. And I know that we've had at least one person go through our certification that was hearing impaired and that, that closed caption was so important for them to understand these concepts. Yeah. But regardless of where we're at on that, we, we know that we are trying to be the gospel to all people. And that goes back to the theological truth that you talked about, the Imago Dei. We are all created in his image and every person has a word. Okay, so strategic, relevant, and we've got to know that the sports rec and fitness is strategic across the world. The relevancy of a particular sport, a particular outreach is going to be different across the world. Efficient. Why is that part of it? Well, part of it is because we do have limited resources, don't we? And so if a particular congregation doesn't have a lot of money, it may have a small leadership core, it may not have a facility or equipment, how can they go do this? And so efficiency is that we've got to maximize our resources or even more so our limited resources to be able to go and make the map the best and the most and the maximize our impact. And so sometimes I think we get some of our congregations that are underdeveloped in some of these areas and they look at some of these facilities that I just mentioned and you just, I can't believe you just said, uh, Dr. Linville, that, that, Ten million dollars? We haven't spent we haven't spent a half a million dollars in the entire existence of our church. What do we do? And so, but we we don't want people to uh, we don't want people to get de depressed or or defeated. Do what you can do. But what is the thing that you can do? Starting with who are you supposed to reach? Then you find out what are their leisure pursuits. And what can you do to help with that? What can you do to maximize that? The efficiency is so important because at the end of the day, if your sports rec and fitness ministry is not actually producing, reproducing reproducers, you're, you're not discipling future disciple makers, then the people who are running the books of your congregation are going to look at this and say, we can do better someplace else, doing something else. This is not nearly as strategic or relevant as you say it is. So efficiency is incredibly important to evaluate, which is why it's one of the fourfold evaluative rubrics. And that's a, we're going to uh, take a quick break here, and then we're going to start unpacking this a little bit more and uh, getting a little bit more specific in on a couple of these things. Um, so uh, hang with us. We'll be right back. Hi there. My name is Dan Stouffer, and uh, I am the Director of Church Relations and Associate Executive Director of CSRM. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to is our Small Church Initiative. And what we're talking about our churches with a uh, pre-pandemic attendance of less than 250 who are maybe looking to start a sports or rec or fitness ministry, or maybe looking to improve, but don't feel like they necessarily have all the resources to make that happen. Listen, 
we can get creative and we just want to help with consultation and coaching and help you to understand that we are for you because no one understands a minister or a pastor or a director or a volunteer like those who are currently doing that. So we're here about relationships and resources. And if we can help you, if you're a smaller church, to do just that, we're here for you. So reach out to us. We'd be happy to follow up. Check out our website. Contact us there. And uh, we will be in touch very soon. So welcome back. We are here with Dr. Greg Linville. We are still talking about the fourfold rubric. Um, Dr. Linville walked us through those four pieces before for our short break here. Um, strategic, relevant, efficient, and effective. Um, you know, this is something that we, everybody within ministry is going to struggle with at some point is how do I know that I'm being effective in my ministry? Um, when things start going bad, how do I know if it's a matter of method? Is this a matter of theology? Is this a matter of philosophy? Going back to our three-tier paradigm, um, especially in the context of us here within the idea of ministry misfits, sometimes it's very hard to even separate out, is this a, is, am I being effective or is this something where I'm just way out of my league and I need to just, need to just pack up and leave? Um so we're, we're going to start breaking this down a little bit more. So typically, um, we, we like to break these up. Instead of four, we like to break these up into two. And so we talk about strategic relevance and then efficient effectiveness. Um, and so the, the, first, the first part of this, and this really is kind of, again, where the idea for this podcast came from as far as being strategic and being relevant is this idea of it doesn't matter how good your strategy is if it's not relevant to the people that are around you and the audience that you're reaching. Um, and this is something that is becoming not just in the sports ministry world. It's kind of always been there in the sports ministry world. That's part of why, um, you know, the, the, the podcast that we're doing here fits so well within the CSRM overwhelming victory framework. Sports ministers always have kind of been on the outside looking in in a way with ministry because you know we we're we're more out in the community we're bringing people in um you know and we're we're providing a place for them and so there's much more relational value going on than you know a lot of other ministry sectors but th this is something that's becoming increasingly more common in the american church among all areas of ministry you know whether it's the worship setting, whether it's the um, style of preaching, you know, recently and going back to Bradley, it's the idea of, okay, what do, where do we stand on social issues like social, you know, like um, Black Lives Matter or All Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter. Um, you know, lately in the U.S., we can even get into, there's even the, the divide as far as what's strategically relevant. Do we have, do we say you need to wear a mask in our building or not? All of these things are starting to kind of pile up and it can be very, very stressful and disheartening for, for people in ministry. So, Dr. Lim, let's talk a little bit. How do, how do we actually find, I know you, you started going into a little bit, but how do we actually find something that is strategic and relevant that actually can work within our, our ministries? Yeah, and then we have to end up with, uh, is it actually being effective? And so if if you're, we have a small church initiative that's going on, that's being really pioneered by our new executive director coming on here. And if you, if, if you have a church that is 50 people, and that's a lot of us out there, probably most of those churches would have access to either an outdoor volleyball court or a softball baseball field. And what we would recommend for them to be strategic and relevant is just to get one softball team, one men's softball team, maybe one women's, maybe one co-ed and do a you and who the you is the person who's sitting in the pew on Sunday. That's not a sheep. It's a you that's a person. And the, the, that you then goes and recruits a who, somebody who's not part of the church, would you come and play on my softball team this summer? 
would you come and play in this outdoor volleyball? A, a sand volleyball court is is not going to cost you that much to put in. And most churches, most congregations have a spot of land they could do an outdoor sand volleyball court. Another one that's very economical, efficient, remember, would be for young adults with the ultimate frisbee league mm -hmm. and you and you just start doing ultimate frisbee just do something simple it would be strategic because it's efficient it can happen it doesn't take a lot you find a coach you find an assistant coach you find a league director you got two or three people is what you need and then you need your congregants to come and invite people and and that's where we would recommend people to start uh, if you are at a mega church of some sort, we're going to ask you to start by actually evaluating your su success statistics. How many of those people, some of them have thousands of people come through their facilities, how many of them are actually being engaged in what we call evangelistic atmospheres and evangelistic conversations? so that they can begin to move people towards a personal faith in Christ and personally joining a congregation. We think this is very important. Now, joining a congregation doesn't take you to heaven. Only the faith in Christ does. But that faith in Christ is only developed in the local congregation. So we ask people to evaluate where they are and just start where they need to go. And then we've got to go to that success statistic. And What's actually you. effective? I think, think part of what um, you just brought up is a good place to also break down is that when we, we talk about evaluating where you are, there's two, two parts to that because we're, we are talking, one, literally, where are you? Um, you know, what, what is your, your neighborhood? What your is your community? Geographic setting. And, and this is something where, you know, we, we've said it before, but, you know, if, if your church demographic does not represent the demographics of your community, then you've at least missed part one and two of strategic or relevant or both. Yes. Um, you know, if, if you are actually doing ministry that's strategically relevant to your community, your church is going to start diversifying and looking like the community that you're in. Um, but the other side of that, and this is where you, you started going a little bit here, is you also have to evaluate where you are as a church. And this is something that we've, we've discussed a little bit with the Small Church Initiative. Um, we discussed a little bit on the CSRM podcast. We've discussed it on the Tuesday Talks a lot. Um, but, but finding something that is not just strategic for your community and relevant to your community, but something that is strategically effective for your community, but still relevant to the culture of the church that you are in. Um, it's, it needs to fit the mission. It needs to fit the vision of your church. Um, you know, th this is something where your, your church, if it is, if this, if your church does not have a, a mission and vision that can fully incorporate what you're doing, it's probably not strategically relevant for your church. It may be relevant for your community, but it may not be for the church. And so that's when you have to start having discussions. Is the church being effective, effectively efficient, efficiently effective, or is it that we need to reevaluate first at the church level and then evaluate ministry wise? And this is again, why it's so important for all people in ministry to have that three tier paradigm model of, you're only going to be able to do that if you know where the theological truths are at, if you've got the philosophical, biblically-based principles that you are applying to how you're doing your ministry as a church, the way that your beliefs are structured, the way that your constitution is structured, what your mission and vision is. The, these things are, are they, they are not separate. They all build on each other. They all play together. Um, but before we run out of time here, we want to we want to just quickly go into and this is one that I think is a little bit more harder for us to understand. I think a lot of us may be able to wrap our minds around strategically relevant because it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, even efficiency is something that we kind of understand, um, you know, budgets, things like that. But the actual idea of what does a successful ministry actually look like is a much harder concept to grasp. So. 
for the last five, 10 minutes here, if you could just share with us, what does an effective ministry look like in terms of a whole ministry? And then also, what does an effective ministry look like for the individual person that's actually doing it? What does an effective ministry for the minister look like? Yeah, effective is, is the end result of all of this. You're not going to be effective if you're not strategic, if you're not relevant, and you're not efficient, okay? But now, assuming that, what still is, we beg the question, what is effective? This is where a church has to sit down in their leadership and determine what they, what their vision is. A vision is what you see at the end of all of your activity, all of your action, all of your planning, all of your work. That's the shore we're sailing to. What's, what's effective? So we call that success statistics. You've got to be able to quantify. And numbers do help us. But we also need anecdotal stories to help us understand it. It's a both and. It's not an either or. So that, that success statistic is how many people that were a year ago or before the ministry impacted them were far from Jesus and far from his church. Okay, that's the person that we're called to go reach. How are we doing that? Okay, so you're positioned. And one of the things that came to my mind, we know of a church that they, they just put in over a million dollar facility. It's a fairly small church. It might be a couple hundred people, but they made a commitment to this. And what they found was that a whole new group of people that had come from another continent had landed in their, their, their geographic community, but they were scared to come to anything. So how are they going to then strategically, relevantly reach those people who are far from Jesus? And so what's, what's then the criteria for success? Is it just getting them in the program that they're playing soccer or they're in a fitness program is it that out of that they pray to receive christ one day or is it that after receiving christ that they get baptized or after getting baptized do they join the church as a member do they start coming to the worship services or is it that they then are reaching their family and their neighbors and they become disciples of this of, of new disciples so what do you deem as success? I would say all of that is a success. And all of that is, is effectiveness. But unless it keeps moving people through, it becomes less effective than if it goes all the way through. So I think it's great to be able to have that initial success statistic of how many people were in our sports track and fitness, total number. Then what's the next thing? How many of them were given a chance to respond to the gospel and how many did personally respond to the gospel? And then you can go through how many were baptized. How many, and, and I think that each of those, what you're going to see is going to be kind of a funnel and it narrows down, but, what we want to have happen is we at least have that step by step. And so for a church, it's corporately, are we getting that big funnel at the top and then bringing people down and more by more step by step, keeping in mind that this person up here is eventually going to come down here. So it's not like it's, it's always narrower, but it's just that they're coming at their own pace, often six to seven years for people. Okay, and then you, the, the second part of your question, you thought I might have forgot this, but what's the individual sports minister? I think the individual sports minister has a, a little different rubric of effectiveness. How well has he been able or she been able to help a particular congregation understand that overall what I just explained would be effective for the church? How well has that person, that sports minister, been able to recruit train and influence and encourage people to come and be local missionaries how well another way would be how well has that sports minister been able to impact the lead pastor the elders the 
the worship team, so to speak, that on a Lord's Day morning worship, traditional worship experience, because we believe you can worship through sport too, but your traditional worship, how is that more strategically relevant to that person that has moved into the community from that other continent? What do we need to do to change to be able to adapt our Sunday morning, our Bible study midweek, our prayer time to incorporate those new believers from that other culture? And that's when the sports minister is effective, is when they change the culture of their congregation to make it evangelistic disciple making in all those phases. Is that making sense? Yeah, I think that that last piece there is really, um, you know, the place that we we probably want to close out on is this idea of, you know, your the effectiveness more so than necessarily individual numbers for the minister is about did you change the culture of the ministry that you were in? Um, you know, we just talked about the fact. Perfect example: Vicky Byler is doing, and Ryan Wolf are, is they're doing that within the church within sports ministry, even within just us here locally within CSRM, they're changing the culture of how we're doing things in the way that we're looking at things creatively. Um, You know, you know, this, this is one of those things where it, 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 you know, one, one of the places that I have experienced a lot is when, you know, going into job interviews with churches and the question that always gets asked is how many people have you said the prayer with? And if I say none, then I'm immediately thrown out. But the reality is that in all the ministries I've been a part of, the amount of people I've been able to baptize that were already Christians that have come out and that now are actually saying, I'm ready to make the next step, that number is just as important as the number of people that have said the prayer. Or in the case of, uh, you know, if I'm a pastor going into a church where, you know, the community is just completely unchurched, but we're able to get programming going. And now all of a sudden we have relationships being built this, you know, the relational um, redemptive reconciliatory, all those R's that we use. If we're able to build those relationships up, that's still just as effective because we've changed the culture of the community from being completely unreached to now we at least have conversations started with them. Yeah, and those me, go for it. Yeah. Let me pick up a little bit on that. Because what you're doing is you're expanding on some of what I'm saying, which is great. And I, and I feel prompted by the Holy Spirit to add that in terms of the individual sports minister, there is a personal, that they, a personal area where they are actually reaching a person who's far from Jesus themselves. And so success is corporate. We first have to have what is success? What is the congregation viewing as success. And I suggested points along that way and that they all should be seen as good points. And then off of that, the sports minister is effective when they help change a culture to the church, but also the individual effectiveness of an individual group of people that the Lord has laid on that individual sports minister's heart who is far from Jesus and that they personally are the ones being called to go reach them. And I think that's really, really important. We can't overlook that. Yeah. But it all ends up in the same vein, does it not? And that is that we are reaching those far from Jesus in this church. And whether we're doing it individually, we're empowering other individuals, we're changing the church culture, all of that comes in. And let me say, and I know you've referred to this, these are the ology books that we've written and are out there. The missiology book sent that everybody is sent to reach somebody. And how can the church do that mission? And soteriology, what does it mean to be saved? How how do we get people saved? And then the ecclesiology, putting the church back in the game. What is the church? How do we get people in the church? All that. This is all out there that people need to embrace and become fluent in. And this is a good place for us to, to, to stop for now because, you know, that all hopefully this has been helpful in helping you, um, you know, 
figure out how effective you actually are. Um, you know, whether you're on one end where you feel like you're not effective at all, or whether you're on one end where you feel like you're overly effective. Hopefully this has helped you re reevaluate. Cause you know, we, the whole purpose of us doing this is the fact that ministry is hard and people that are outside of ministry don't always understand that. And so we want to be here as an encouragement to you, um, help you rethink some things, help change the culture. Like we were just talking about, and, and get these kind of conversations started, whether you're a sports minister, whether you're a church that's looking to start a sports ministry, whether you're the youth pastor that's trying to decide whether, you know, what direction to go with your students. You know, the, these are the conversations we want to see churches start having as staff and as leadership teams, whether you're the deacons or the elders or the actual pastoral staff, or even just the volunteer team. We want churches to be able to start having these kind of conversations to be able to be more strategically relevant to their local community, which then expands out to the nation and eventually the universal church as a whole. So, Dr. Linville, I'm going to keep you on for one more. Um, we're going to talk a little bit next week um, about kind of now where does all this lead us? You know, what does this look like? Why did why why did you become executive producer for this? Um, so stick around for that. Um, again, we should be at this point on all, all major platforms, um, for podcasts, audio wise. We're also on YouTube and Facebook. You can hit us up on Twitter. Um, let us know what you think. Let us know if you have any questions. If you have any questions for Dr. Linville, we'll make sure he gets it as well. You can check out all of his books on the CSRM store and we will talk to you all later. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Overwhelming Victory Flicks, Overwhelming Victory Radio, and Ministry Misfit Media. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers. Our theme music is entitled Rain and provided by Morning Light Music. For more information about Overwhelming Victory, visit overwhelmingvictory.org. For more information on CSRM, visit csrm.org. If you are interested in listening to our sister podcast on the Overwhelming Victory Radio Network, visit overwhelmingvictory.org backslash OV Radio. If you're interested in contacting Ministry Misfit Media or have your own story to share, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Ministry Misfit or email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com.